What I'm kind of going to talk through today is around intelligent solutions with a focus on industry, around the vision versus current reality, and really looking at how should we get from the current reality to that vision with a focus on high-level decision-making. And an example I'll talk to is in the scheduling domain. So if we look at factories of the future, there's a vision out there of totally automated factory, robots doing everything, even maintenance on each other. <clears throat> and we are progressing towards that vision. Um, you know, factory data systems are getting better, factory automation is getting better, but the current situation is we're in a transition phase. We're beginning to transform from human-centered activities towards a more automated approach. But how long will this transition phase last? So if we look at how artificial, artificial intelligence is progressing, if we go back to 1980s, Deep Blue created by IBM, beat the world uh, champion Gary Kasparov in chess. Now, at this moment in time, I certainly remember as people thought artificial intelligence was going to take over the world in a very short time, and that hasn't quite happened. If you look earlier this year, AlphaGo, created by Google DeepMind, won a Go match against the world champion. Now, Go is a game played with black and white stones, for those who aren't familiar with it, and you're kind of trying to control a section of the board. Now, it's a much more complicated game than chess. It requires judgment and strategy, and there's a lot more potential moves than there is in chess. And from an artificial intelligence point of view, this wasn't expected just yet. This was probably expected a couple of years out. So <clears throat> from an AI point of view, this was very good progress. However, let me put on another hat and say, if I was an industry leader, if I'm a factory manager, I could look at this progress and say, 1987, you won a game of chess. 30 years later, you won a more complicated game. It doesn't really tick a box for me. So, when you look at artificial intelligence solutions today, would a manager of a complex factory give complete control to algorithms? I think we'd all be agreed that the answer to that is no. And even people who don't agree on anything else would probably say the answer to that is no. So the question that is, algorithms capable of running a complex factory, like when do we think that might happen? Or more importantly, how do we think that might happen? So AI at the moment is successful but it's in bounded situations. And what I'm really talking about today is how we can begin to use AI for higher level decisions, decisions where you require judgment, you require strategy, allowing for the fact that AI solutions today do not understand a lot of context. And I think what we need to recognize also is that it's not going to be one giant step. And we're not going to wake up someday and we suddenly have an algorithm that's this good that can control all our factory. So we need to look at what are the steps we could do today. How do we start this journey? And remembering that the goal is not perfection. The goal is that we are better than we were yesterday. So one potential improvement, and I think this was referred to this morning, is to treat human operators and automated systems not autonomously, but as team members in what's known as a joint cognitive system. So what you're trying to do here is move from a situation where you have a human who's utilizing technology, but not really collaborating with technology, to a situation where you pretty much have technology having a conversation with the human. And a really good example of that is how sat-nav systems are. And we probably don't even think of how sat-nav systems work. But if you're anything like me, you probably used a sat-nav to get here today. Um, you took it out of your pockets. You put in where you're going. It gave you a number of options. Um, it, there was a default option, which you probably chose, and just yeah, I'm grand with that. And, and you selected. But you were in control of what you did. Um, after that, if there was a crash or anything, like there was on the M4 this morning, if anyone was using it, it gave you an alternative. It said, maybe you should go this way instead. So it started suggesting it's continuously working in the background and suggesting updates to, for you. At any point, again, you're still in control. You can choose a different path. You could decide to go a different way. You could make a mistake and go a different way. But it just keeps telling you from where you are now, here's, here's the best thing you can do. And the culture around that is really interesting and actually quite important and something we need to get into industry. So the culture around sat-nav systems is very much about the human being in control. If you remember when sat-nav systems came in first, there were stories in the newspaper how people drove off a cliff following a sat-nav system. And no one went, well, I'm never using sat-nav systems again. That clearly doesn't work. The culture was, well, what an idiot. Who'd follow a sat-nav system all the way off a cliff? That's just crazy. So that culture of saying, well, actually, you use an artificial intelligence algorithm, it suggests a solution to you, but you actually do apply a bit of human cop on at the end of that to make sure you have the right decision. So decision making, is it perfect? Can we expect perfect? Of course not. 
Um, and this is something about expectations, especially in industrial solutions. There's a feeling sometimes that just because a solution is automated, it is perfect, which is not true. So this is around decision support, about augmenting the human, not replacing the human, about helping them make the right decision. In saying that, there's a few buts here. Industry and the you know, manufacturing industry in particular is a very difficult domain. It is intolerant to certain types of errors. So um, if, as you manufacture a product, some manufacturing may take three months. And if you miss a, maybe a time window or something as your schedule is wrong, the entire batch or the entire product has to be scrapped. So you do need to put in defenses against certain types of errors. Conflicting objectives is another one. And, and this is an important one about how difficult conflicting objectives are, even human to human, and even trying to understand your expectations. So again, maybe using the SatNav example, if I said to you, I want to get to Galway as fast as I can, and as cheaply as I can, and they're equally important to me, I'd probably get 100 different answers from the audience. Um, some people might say, well, he probably means to just avoid the tolls and take 10 minutes, but like the cheapest way is to walk, and that might take two days. So if you said they're equally important, you know, you'd get a shock if you got a solution that said, well, that's going to take you a day. So even, even as a human, expressing what you want in this situation and getting something back can be quite difficult. Um, there are ways of dealing with this in artificial intelligence. So you, you, in these kind of solutions, you can use things like Pareto fronts. You can do what a sat-nav does. It gives you a few solutions. But these typically work at their best when you've got two or three you know, conflicting objectives. And as you move into, say, a factory situation, you've got multiple, multiple conflict, conflicting objectives. It often goes five, six, seven, and not just conflicting objectives, but conflicting stakeholders. You have people who each have one objective, actually, but it's different to what everybody else is. So you'll have a manufacturing manager who wants to optimize production. You'll have an energy manager who wants to reduce energy. You'll have a resource manager who wants to do it with the least amount of resources. You'll have a maintenance manager who wants his tasks done. You'll have a finance manager who says everyone's doing it wrong. And every person wants to do their own, have their own input into this situation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about this now, just around the area of scheduling and about how you can do this. So appropriate scheduling ensures that as a business, you're getting maximum value for your resources. So it makes perfect sense. It's a complex task. It involves understanding many interacting variables. But large savings have been demonstrated using optimization. So I guess the question is, is why aren't all companies using it? And if you look around industries today, very few companies are using these kind of solutions. And if you look at what they do do, there's two current methods. The first method is, I guess, what you call the old-fashioned method, where you use humans or you have Excel-based templates. And there are some good things about this. It's flexible. It's collaborative. You do get all the stakeholders at the table, but it's very limited in terms of the scope and the speed of response. After that, you've got the more automated approach, which has its advantages in terms of scope and speed, but also loses in terms of the flexibility and the, the ability to speak with st all your stakeholders and get the right selection for everyone. So can we combine the advantages of both of these was really something we looked at as a, as a technology. So if we look closely at why current scheduling offers, offerings are not widely used, what it comes down to actually is more around the culture and around interaction issues than the algorithms itself. And this was touched on earlier as well about how difficult they are for end users to trust. And where does trust come from? It comes from understanding what's going on and maybe being able to amend it if you feel the need. But if you go back to that Go example, where the Go artificial intelligence beats the human, but as the match was going on, other players around the world who were looking at that couldn't really understand what the artificial intelligence was doing. And it was only in hindsight they could say, yeah, actually, that makes sense to me now. So, what needs to be provided in terms of to creating trust is to have a clear connection to the business value. So it seems to be an obvious thing, but a lot of solutions out there right now don't really have that. From an algorithm perspective, there still are some issues. We do have to acknowledge that artificial intelligence can be inflexible. It can be imperfect when dealing with new situations. And they do rely completely on the data represented in the underlying systems. So it doesn't deal with some context. So from a business point of view, we still have to acknowledge that a lot of business decisions are based on human <coughs> emotions and decisions. So if you as a customer could only meet, or if you as a uh, provider could only meet two, one of your customer's uh, requests and you had two requests coming in, how would you choose which one to meet and which one to maybe let go and be a day late? That at the moment is a very human decision. It's based on your relationships with these people, 
how likely they are to cancel an order, if they, how long, uh, likely they are to never do business with you again. You know, would a nice bottle of Bordeaux and an apology cover it? So that's a very human decision rather than an artificial intelligence decision. <clears throat> so what we've developed is this kind of what we call a gray box scheduling approach where you have a seamless kind of transition between human and automated planning. So what you're trying to do here is create a conversation between the technology and the human. So you have your artificial intelligence, just like in the SatNav system. It's working continuously in the background. It's giving you updated solutions all the time. But again, control rests with the human. The human's allowed to interact with it. He can make changes. He can say, give me another solution. Here's some input. A couple of key things with this, though. As you interact with us, there's a couple of things you need to know. Real time, you need to say, if I make a change, what's the impact? You've got five, six different stakeholders. They're all trying to get a solution that's better for themselves. You need to really immediately be able to see that. The other thing is around you know, understanding. So if you're looking at a situation, you need a heap of visual cues that helps you decide and see what's going on. So if you look at a job, say, here that's maybe late, and you're wondering, well, why is that not being processed earlier? And you can look and say, OK, it's got a prerequisite. There's a heap of other information here <coughs> that could help me decide, do I want to do something different? I can interact with it, I can hit an optimize button and get a solution back. And get, you know, it tells me immediately the impact of my KPIs. Now that, or my indicators, my business value, that was a, a live video of something. So that gives, that's another requirement that needs to go into the artificial intelligence creation. That takes about two seconds. You can't have a conversation with a technology if it takes more than two or three seconds. As soon as people these days as soon as something doesn't react in two or three seconds, people start hitting refresh, people start reacting. You can't take 20, 30 seconds and let people play with it. It needs to be reactive in the space of one to two seconds. So where we've done this kind of approach, um, we've done this across Ireland, uh, UK and Spain. We've demonstrated quite significant savings, up to 40%. And that's across multiple sectors using multiple form factors, anything from tablets to laptops to large interactive screens. And that, that's all very use case dependent. So just some key points, key takeaways. So AI is progressing. But for st strategy and real decision making, I think AI for now is more in the space of augmented and assisted intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. I'm going to go back to that Go game for a minute. It was the best out of five game. Um, it's a little bit simplistic, but maybe to say that the artificial intelligence won the first three games fairly, in a fairly straightforward manner. It came to game four, the human Maybe he was a little bit annoyed having lost the first three games and he'd lost the series. He played a much more aggressive game. He did a do or die approach and the response of the artificial intelligence wasn't good at all. Completely lost that game. So it got hit with an edge case that wouldn't normally happen and it didn't really respond well. The fifth game was even quite interesting. The AI did win it, but it missed an actually a standard move that you'd have expected maybe an artificial intelligence algorithm that, to pick up because it had used a couple of hundred thousand games of Go to learn um, before it went into this match. And it missed a standard move that had a standard defense and made quite a bad mistake at one point. Now, it did recover and win. So the point is, the AI was better, but it was not perfect. And if you had a human maybe in the loop of that, that once or twice during those games could have maybe guided the artificial intelligence, you might have ended up with an even better solution, much like what was referred to earlier with chess games these days. So for now, humans still have a role to play. Joint cognitive systems like this can help overcome these implementation barriers because these implementation barriers are really often more cultural interaction than to do with the algorithm themselves. But we do need to develop solutions then with better human, com human computer interaction to improve penetration into the market, especially in areas like industry and manufacturing, which are not as receptive as some other industries. The sample system we've created there demonstrates excellent results with up to 40% improvements. And it's really this approach will help the transition to use of AI in higher level decision making. So Irish Manufacturing Research, we're uh, um, supported by the Enterprise Ireland and IDA. So we work in the area of analytics, also in the areas of energy efficiency, novel training methods. So if anyone's interested in applying such solutions or working with us, please visit our stand or our contact details are there. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>